Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the screw tape letters, a demon complains about the British people during World War II, saying that they would speak very abusively about their enemies, the Germans. But then, if a German pilot ended up crashing near them or something like that, well, they would go out and actually help them. The demon explains that the problem here was that these people were actually acting out their love toward their neighbor in front of them while keeping their hatred contained in their imagination. Satan, however, would like just the opposite. He wants our love to be confined to the acts of our imagination. He wants our love confined in the imagination while our actual actions toward those people around us are complete hatred. I find it particularly valuable to keep this strategy of Satan in our minds, especially as we come into another political season. We cannot, as Christians, allow our imagined ideas about the good of humanity excuse us from showing real love to the real people right in front of us in our lives. Today, on the topic of showing love to those people who are right in front of us, we're talking about the family. For much of our lives, our family makes up those people uh, who are most in front of us. Therefore, uh, one of the primary places that we are able to reflect God's love to others is in our families. Today we are reading from Genesis chapter 2 verses 18 through 24. Uh, In this section we see marriage and family as one of the basic building blocks of God's creation. We'll start reading from there right now. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. This is God's word. From here, we'll discuss three main points. Number one, the rich blessings God in, uh, grants to us through family. Number two, uh, the fam- that how a family very often reveals our broken sinfulness. And finally, number three, uh, we'll talk about how God transforms our view of the family through the gospel. Um. I've always found this section from Genesis 2 to be very fascinating, this account of the creation of marriage. If you remember uh, at the beginning of Genesis, God creates the various parts of his world, always declaring his creations to be good. At the very end, he says it is very good. But then we get to see something in this good creation that is not good. God says it is not good for the man to be alone. This is vital for us to remember. We uh, care much about uh, our individuality today. Uh, We want to be our own people. We want to be strong and independent, right? But the reality is that even those who most value being alone among us, uh, even they need other people. In fact, one of the worst punishments that prisoners receive when they're in prison is solitary confinement. It's torturous to be too alone for too long. Furthermore, uh, we are so much stronger with somebody else sharing the load, aren't we? We can accomplish so much more when we work together with other people, can't we? Individuality is not wrong. Uh, We just need to recognize its limitations. There are rich blessings to be found in unity with other people as well. And this is one of the first blessings we find in God's creation of marriage and family. Family brings us a closeness that is rarely found in other relationships. For most people... Uh, Their closest and deepest relationships will be those people within their family. Uh, Most of our, most of the relationships we have around our lives are ones that we can choose, right? You can pick your friends, you can pick the places you're going to work and therefore pick your coworkers. Uh, You can pick where you're going to meet people, right? We have a lot of those choices, but our family members, they're just there, right? God gives them to us 
with no choice on our part. You don't get to pick who your parents are. You don't get to pick who your brothers and sisters are. But that can be a beautiful thing, especially in those moments where we fail and fall short. Uh, many of those people that would choose us, like friends or neighbors or coworkers, many of them will abandon us. But very often, it is our family that is still there for us. Not always, certainly, but very often that's the reality. There are far more blessings that God intends for us through family. In fact, uh, every single one of us were created in this way, from one man, one woman coming together to become our father and mother. And this simple, uh, simple fact demonstrates how marriage and family are one of the basic building blocks of all of human society. Even modern statistics show again and again the importance of these essential parts of God's creation. Studies show all the time that married couples have higher income, longer lives, better health, less violence, less alcoholism, less uh, poverty, and so too with children. Kids that are raised by their married biological parents statistically find all of these blessings significantly more so than do kids raised in other situations. But that brings us now to our second part. If God intends such good blessings for us through marriage and family, then why are so many of us missing those things? If you keep reading in Genesis, you'll find how quickly God's design for marriage fell apart. Adam, who excitedly burst out in poetry at the sight of his wife, would soon blame her for his own failures. Ever since Adam's sin, family does still serve to bring those blessings that God intended, but it also serves to show the brokenness of our sin. Uh, The closeness that can happen within a family should it give us deep relationships, but now it often becomes an opportunity for us to hurt one another in very deep ways. The love of marriage so often ends in the tearing apart of divorce, even among God's people. The stability, guidance, and affection that children ought to receive from their parents often turns into a chaotic nightmare of fear, neglect, and abuse. Many of our families are torn apart, not necessarily by our sin, but by the results of sin, by death. Many of you know very well the pain of a family ruined by sin. God's people are not exempt from the many different ways that a family can become more of a curse than a blessing. A family broken by sin is one of the clearest demonstrations of humanity's fall. To you who feel that pain, know that this is the exact brokenness that Jesus came to heal. For those of us harmed by sinful parents, God adopts us into his family so that we actually can have a good, perfect, and loving Father in heaven. For those of us brokenhearted by the sin of a spouse or partner, Jesus shows himself to be the perfect, loving husband to us, his bride. So greatly did he love us that he died to make us his radiant bride without any blemish. Where our families may have abandoned us, Jesus is still there with us. Where our families condemned us, Jesus is there offering grace and mercy. Where we realize that we were the ones to fail our families, Jesus calls us to repentance and the new life. Where death has ripped our families apart, Jesus offers us, offers to put us back together through the resurrection. And this brings us now to our third point then. That gospel realization is what transforms our view of family. The gospel brings us to a a whole new understanding of what family is all about. For as much as sin may have devastated our family, God offers us hope and new life through Christ. There are a lot of people that feel trapped by their past familial failures, but Jesus' victories for us give us hope for a greater future. Jesus' love shows us uh, that there is a new way to look at our broken families. The first step with Christ is always that we repent of our sins and trust in the good news that through Jesus Christ we truly are forgiven. Next, we learn to now show this same love of Christ to others that are around us, to those people that are right in front of us. And as we said, very often it is those people right in front, or it is our families who are those people right in front of us. We learn to forgive them, just as Jesus forgives us. We learn to seek the good of others, even when it costs us. But at the same time, we learn to find that proper balancing act where, yes, we are uh, working with people, but we are also not enabling sin. Again, Jesus doesn't call us, or doesn't let us live our lives in such a way that we keep sinning worse and worse. No, he calls us to turn away from these things. 
So too, uh, Jesus does not abandon us when we fail. He comes alongside us. He helps us in our weakness. He helps us to move forward, to turn from our sin, and to do what is right. We are able to do the, the same thing then for one another, and especially for our families. We can, see, uh, we can seek to right whatever wrongs we have done and to help each other to bear one another's burdens. We also look to the scriptures to grow in our understanding of whatever role God has placed us in. If you are married, then seek to be a godly spouse. If you are single or divorced or widowed, learn how you can glorify God and serve others right there where you are. If you're a parent, raise your children in Christ. If you are a child, learn to honor and respect your parents as God teaches us. Wherever, you, wherever uh, we find ourselves, God promises us wisdom so that we can live out our lives in a Christ-like way, regardless of what our roles are. If your family is an absolute mess, well, trust that God will get you through it. If you have a pretty good family, first off, be grateful. <laughs> Recognize that that is not so normal. Uh, be grateful to God for that. But also be careful not to judge those who don't have that same blessing you do. Instead, look for how you might be able to help and serve them. Also, do not forget uh, the way in which the church can help families. The church ought to be a place where broken families can come to find help and support. It, all, it also ought to be a place where we can address wrongs and have them righted. May God send his spirit among us, that we might work together to help strengthen the families of our communities and to work with those families who are falling apart so that we all might grow together into what God desires. My dear family in the faith, Satan would love nothing more than for us to keep our acts of love merely in our imagination while we act out real hatred towards those people around us. Instead, let us learn what God has to teach us about loving those right in front of us. God intends great blessings to us through those people in front of us and especially through our families. And while we certainly recognize the curses that sin has brought to the family, let us never forget the strength and encouragement that God gives us as he adopts us into his family, as he calls us to live out a life of love in whatever relationships we have. Wherever God has placed you, whether single or married, whether in a broken family or a whole one, know that you are God's dear child, that you are an heir of eternal life. And for this reason, we cannot allow our love to only be imaginary like Satan wants. Instead, as children of God, let us live out God's love with whoever we find right in front of us. Amen.